Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar, Using Social Media Monitoring for Campaign Tracking. I am joined today by our host, Joel Windles. I'm Joel and I'm the Marketing Manager for Europe, Middle East and Asia. And Kelly Ottenry. Hi, I'm the Technical Trainer for the US. Today we are going to cover tracking campaigns in the social media age, including going beyond just counting mentions. And then we will cover a uh, live demo of Brandwatch, including categories and rules, so you can see some of this stuff live and in action. We'll go for about 20 minutes today um, for webinar content, including the demonstration, and then about 10 minutes of Q&A. Thank you very much. Um, yep, so I'm Joel, and I'm going to be talking about campaigns in the social media age. So when we say campaigns, we're really talking about marketing campaigns. Now, what is the purpose of marketing um, and campaigns? I mean, there are lots of different reasons why you might want to do one. It might be retention, it might be um, acquisition, it might be exposure. But ultimately, they're all kind of focused on generating visibility, um, depending on whatever the target group may be. Now, different companies will uh, classify campaigns in different ways. So some, like H&M is going to be our example for today, um, might say, OK, this is our billboard campaign. This is the kind of media that we're going to run it on, and this is how we're going to try and measure it. But of course, there are multiple types of mediums and multiple types of campaigns. So we also have things like TV ads and YouTube videos, hashtag campaigns, of course, um, email marketing, competitions, and all the other kind of forms of marketing can be included as, as a campaign. Now, the really good thing about um, being in 2014 or being in this decade is actually that we can start to measure the impact campaigns are having in a way that we've never really been able to before. So, if we return to that billboard I just showed, if we're paying lots of money, if H&M paying lots of money to have a billboard in Times Square, for example, how do they know how many people walked past it? And how do they know how many people looked at it and then went on to buy something from H&M around the corner? The beautiful thing about having all, the, all these conversations and reactions to things online on sites like Twitter and Facebook and other places is that we can actually start to measure and listen to what people are saying in response to different campaigns. And that's what we're going to try and take you through today. This is one campaign that H&M run, which um, I've called the Celebrities Lying Down campaign, but um, I'm sure they have a slightly different term for it. So here they have sponsored three different celebrities, um, Beyonce, David Beckham, and Lana Del Rey. They also have Vanessa Paradis and Guy Ritchie too. Now, these aren't limited just to billboards or just to TV commercials. They're cross-medium um, and focused around different celebrities. So if they're spending $10 million on um, David Beckham, they want to know what kind of impact is that spend having upon um, the customers of H&M and the prospects for H&M. They might begin by listening to all conversation about H&M online. So here is a conversation for a period of about six months for H&M. And there are two pretty significant spikes in the data, so two um, periods in time where people online started talking about H&M a lot more. Now, if we dive into the kind of reasons that people were talking more frequently, we can see the first peak was all about David Beckham. So David Beckham runs um, Bodywear Collection, uh, David Beckham for H&M, oh my god, being one, of course, because he strips. <laughs> um, <laughs> Then the second peak, you have it's even it's an even bigger peak, but it seems to have slightly less of a uh, slightly shorter shelf life, and that's all about Beyonce. And um, almost every single topic on that day is all about Beyonce. So marketing managers for a while have been able to say, look, um, we had a three hundred percent increase in mentions about H and M on the same day that we launched David Beckham, and you can see that a key topic was David Beckham. But I'm going to argue that that's not really good enough because we don't know the specific impact each campaign had. So what I've done here is I've, I've used Brownwatch, but you can use other tools, um, to strip away the mentions that aren't about these celebrities. So I've created a category specifically um, to find the conversation about Beyonce and H&M at the same time. So someone's Facebook status or someone's blog that mentions both of those things. Now you can see is, um, that, yes, those, those peaks remain, like some of the other conversation falls away. Lana Del Rey has talked about for... Um, never hugely on one day, but for quite a long period of time. And um, the two spikes that we saw earlier, say so Beyonce shot through the roof when it was launched, and the Super Bowl advert, which David Beckham was in, uh, managed to generate quite a lot of conversation. So again, some marketing managers might go away and say, look, this is how much conversation we managed to generate. Here it is, uh, the same data, but not spread out over time. So we have 
okay, David Beckham made the biggest impact. Sponsoring David Beckham got 100,000 people talking about H&M. Great. But does this paint the full story? Does generating conversation um, satisfy the needs of a marketer? Well, I don't think it does. So David Beckham, probably more conversation than all of the other ones put together. But what actually was that conversation all about? So when you start to look into it, this kind of thing comes up. So we have um, different languages, different types of people talking about it, um, different ways of speaking. How can we use technology to divide that conversation up and find meaning and insight in it? So here, I've used the same kind of method, but distributed the conversation by region. So people speaking in English markets, uh, you know, the UK, South Africa, the US, they love David Beckham. They think he's a, a gorgeous man that has done a, an excellent thing for H&M. And of course, Beyonce too. But when we look outside of English speaking countries, we see actually Lana Del Rey had the biggest impact. Now, only by starting to divide up this data and, and look into the kind of meanings behind it all, can we start to see these uh, patterns emerge. And maybe H&M for the next campaigns will know that maybe if we feature Lana Del Rey more prominently outside of English speaking markets, we'll have much better success. Now think about how you could do this exact same process, but instead of by region, you could do it by demographics to see how students respond to your different campaigns, or how people age uh, over age 60, or people on Facebook compared to people on Twitter. Um, what I'm trying to encourage here is that if you look beyond just the basic mentions, just the counting of numbers, you can actually start to uncover much richer insights and much uh, more detailed understanding of the impact of your campaigns. So, next slide, sentiment analysis. This is something that comes up an awful lot um, when we do things like webinars at Brandwatch. But in a nutshell, sentiment analysis is technology that tries to determine the tone or sentiment behind um, a mention or a, piece of, a conversation online. So, using um, a complicated series of rules, um, natural language processing, which is a term you might have come across before, you can actually see that um, these tweets that I've listed in the slide have all been determined as positive. So, David Beckham is so fine, like I would just buy his briefs. Uh, that's not my words, that's the tweet. <laughs> uh, I want to buy H&M long sleeve David Beckham. They're basically um, positive things about David Beckham. Um, likewise, we could do the same thing with negative words, you know, um, ugly, um, bad, terrible, that kind of thing. But it's much more complicated than simply matching the right words. Now, using this approach, we can actually look at our campaigns again and see um, the sentiment behind what people were talking about. Now here we're actually seeing um, a fairly significant minority, almost a quarter of all the emotional tweets um, about David Beckham were negative, um, either jealous males or people that don't want to see that kind of <laughs> nudity perhaps, I'm not sure, um, but I could find out. Beyonce, uh, much more positive. So here by dividing up the campaign again, we're starting to see much more of an insight. Intent to purchase, now you might have come across this before, but in case you haven't, what this is, is a description of all the language that is commercially orientated. So it's people talking about actually wanting to buy or purchase a product within an advert. So these four tweets, um, Beyonce's H&M collection, I want, well played, you knew the only thing that would make me buy, employing Beyonce. These are um, indications that people are actually looking and absorbing these campaigns and then actually wanting to go out and buy something. Now this is really powerful stuff because by doing this we can say, okay, we spent a million dollars on this particular campaign, but how many people actually wanted to go out there and buy the product because of it? Using technology like Brandwatch, we can actually find out. Now, this final slide shows um, the exact same conversation before, but I've stripped away everything that wasn't talking about wanting to buy H&M clothes or wanting to go and pre-order something or try something on. Now, uh, you can actually see that although Beckham generated double the conversation, like I showed you earlier, Beyonce generated even more conversation um, specifically about this kind of language. So people wanted, people saw Beyonce in the adverts and went, wanted to go out and buy something. Now, we've, I've taken you on a journey that said, at the very beginning, the indication was the more the better. But actually, when you start to uh, look a little bit deeper, you see a completely different story emerge. Um, and we're really releasing a report next week that talks all about intent to purchase. So uh, I encourage you to look out for that. Now, if that all looks too good to be true, or you know the data is all too perfect, Kelly's going to show you exactly how you can do this kind of thing in Brandwatch. So, over to you, Kelly. So now that we can see the value that categories and rules have toward better understanding your campaign's performance, I'm going to walk you through a live demo of how you can create your own categories and rules within Brandwatch. 
So in my example, I'm going to be using the global ad campaign for Fiat 500L. Back in February this year, Fiat un unveiled its new four-door car. So this is a milestone for the car company, um, being that it's its first four-door car. So you can imagine the millions of dollars they spent promoting this car and their brand. So within the specific global ad, we have three areas of conversation I want to have a little bit of a deeper dive into and get more insight. So first, I'm going to divide my conversation around the four-door car itself and people talking about their intent to buy the car. So much like Joel was saying with people's intent to buy Beyonce or buy H&M because of Beyonce, we're going to see what the conversation is like for those wanting to buy the car because of this ad. Second, I'm going to look at the conversation surrounding P. Diddy. P. Diddy was the spokesperson used in this ad, and you'll, if you're familiar with the ad, you also know that he's self-promotes with two of his own products, Aqua Hydrate and Revolt Television. So we'll see if there's any conversation surrounding that and if that's a driving force behind the campaign. And lastly, I'm going to be looking at conversation around Pharrell's Happy Song, which was used in the background of the ad, but it was also a worldwide hit. So we'll just see if there's more people talking about the song itself rather than Fiat. So let's go live into the app. Here we can see the dashboard screen, and if you're not familiar with Brandwatch, a dashboard is how you're going to visualize all the data that's coming in. So I've already created one for today, which is right here, and I'll jump into it. And here during the lifespan of the ad, so it was launched back in February and just through last week, we can see that there was a raw number of 4,100 mentions. And looking a little further, we can see the jump in conversation. So here's when the campaign launched. Over the next few days, the conversation died, uh, was died down and then was able to pick back up by something or someone. And like Joel was saying, this is really great to be able to know the conversation driving online and um, if there's any awareness for it, but it's really only painting half that picture. I want to understand what was driving it, what certain areas of the conversation were, so if they were more about P. Diddy or Pharrell. And by creating categories and rules, I now have the ability to see how these three areas of conversation are benchmarking against one another. And we can see that there's much more conversation online, about 3,000 mentions, strictly on P. Diddy and focusing on his presence in the ad. Secondly, Pharrell and his happy song. And then third was intent to purchase. So if I'm Fiat and I've just spent millions of dollars promoting this ad campaign, I'm going to be very interested now to know that all those 4,100 mentions were not specific to the audience wanting to go out and buy my car. They were more targeted towards P. Diddy. If I scroll further down, I can also see the sentiment associated with these mentions. And to make it more interesting, if I remove neutral, now I can see that there is of the conversation for P. Diddy, more of it was negative. So much like the conversation with David Beckham, even though it generated the largest volume of mentions, not all of that was positive. And here we can see, even though a smaller number of mentions for Pharrell's Happy Song, more of those were positive. And just like all of our charts and graphs, they're all interactive. So if I wanted to see exactly these negative mentions and the distribution of them, now I've got mentions like um, fiat commercials with P. Diddy are ruining America, and <laughs> the world has gone crazy. So now, as a marketer, I can understand that maybe a uh, better understanding of why P. Diddy was a good or poor choice for my brand. I was able to create both of these charts through the use of our filters control here. And as you get more familiar with Brandwatch and chart component in general, you can really start to manipulate the data in a variety of ways. So being able to show on which access the type of data, and the breakdown. All of our charts and graphs are fueled by a query. So I'll go to my data panel here and look at the query I've created. And for those not familiar with a query in Brandwatch, it's a search string. So it's comprised of keywords that have a relationship to one another through the use of Boolean operators. If I go into my query here, Now you can get a better understanding of exactly what a query is comprised of. So here I have a series of keywords specific to the campaign. So Fiat or Chrysler, because Fiat's a Chrysler car. Then we also have buzzwords like commercial, campaign, ad, television, all within a proximity of my two other areas of conversation that I wanted to look at. So P. Diddy, spelt in a variety of ways, and also Sean Combs, just in case. Um, then we have Pharrell, spelt in a number of ways. Uh, happy is a very generic term, generic word, so I want to make sure it's relevant to so the song or Pharrell. I have desert, spelled two ways, just in case, and because it happened in the desert, it was also 
um, this idea of a mirage hitting the four-door car was uh, not a real item. So I've included that. And then two products of P. Diddy self-promotes. And then I'm also including all Twitter data and my exclusionary term here. So now that I've created my query, which is going to be fueling all of my data and my dashboard, I want to be able to further dissect my query into those three areas of conversation. So my next step would be to create a category, which is available within our tools panel here. And a category is a great way to be able to structure your data. So if I click New, here I'm presented with a new window where I want to name my category. So in this example, I'm looking at my three areas of conversation, so I'd like to think of it as a campaign breakout. So I'd simply title my category name as campaign breakout. And then my subcategories are how I'm going to create my rule. So all of my subcategories within this campaign breakout should be relevant. So for instance, we have P. Diddy and Pharrell, and lastly, intend to purchase. I want to allow multiple subcategories to be applied. For instance, if you think the way people speak, it's possible that one of these mentions is also going to be included in another mention. So I really want to be able to buy that car that P. Diddy is promoting. Here we have two different rules or two different mentions uh, within two different, sorry, two different <laughs> keywords within the same mention. So we want to make sure that all of them are being able to be um, to be accounted for within these subcategories. So I would then save my category here. And you can see it's the breakout I've done for today. So now that I've created these categories and, and subcategories, they need to have an, an action applied to them. So right now they're like empty buckets that they've separated my query, but now I need to be able to fill them with certain keywords, which is why I create a rule. Here you can see the three rules I've created. And creating a rule is much like creating a uh, query. So I would use a series of keywords like Pharrell and then my operators. And then I would apply it to a specific query. So here's the one I'm interested in for today. And I would apply it to be able to test it and click Next. Here I'd then choose an action. So this is where I'd apply my rule to the specific subcategories I've just created. And since it was surrounding Pharrell, I click that and next. Lastly, I have my two options here. Um, so being able to apply the rule to future mentions only would only start segmenting this area of conversation from today's date forward or to the past and future. So since this campaign happened in February, I wanna make sure that all mentions in the past and the future are being segmented. And then I title it Pharrell. Here we have an overview of what I'm about to create, and I click Save. And just to give you an idea of that intent to purchase language, which will be available later, I have my string here. So keywords like I, I am, and I want to buy that car, I'm considering buying that car, all apply to my query. So if I jump back into the dashboard to bring this full circle, I'm now able to create dashboard tabs that are specific to my rule. So any mention that from the past or the future is going to be living within my different dashboard tabs here. And it's very much like set it and forget it. Any rule, any mention that comes in now in accordance to my rule will be categorized within this dashboard, dashboard tab here. And now we can see how my rules have created this conversation item here. And now if I'm Fiat, I can see exactly my maybe future campaign. So I should consider JLo and P. Diddy in my future ad rather than just P. Diddy. Our Q&A portion now. So if you have any questions, please send them through the uh, chat and go to webinar interface or tweet at us using the hashtag BrandWatchTips. So our first question uh, is actually about sentiment analysis and languages. And that's, is sentiment analysis available for Italian language? And also, how many languages do you cover? Are you kidding? Sure. Right, so we cover 27 different languages and all of our languages are supported with our sentiment analysis. So um, if in particular looking for Italian, then yes, we would cover the Italian language and then the sentiment associated. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next question also on sentiment, um, asking since it's an automated process and it doesn't understand sarcasm, how can data be used as an authentic source? If I said something like, something very sarcastic, like wow, David Beckham is so ugly, <laughs> some people would take that seriously and some people would take it as sarcasm 
And the point here is that even humans can't agree on what's sarcastic. They can't even agree on what's good. If something's cheap, for some brands, that's bad. Um, and for some brands, that's a really good thing. So um, the fact that even humans can't agree, and if I asked everyone on this webinar to agree on, on different sarcasm and, and positive and negative, we can't actually test the accuracy of a machine because we don't know what's right and what's wrong. But having said that, um, technology is never perfect anyway. Um, but it, what it's really useful for is getting a benchmark. So if, even if we're getting about 70 or 80% of this right and 20% of it wrong, it still does give you a really good idea um, on the general overall picture. So if you had a huge peak in, in negative mentions, for example, even though a few of them might be wrong, you're still getting that general impression of what's going on. So hopefully that's helpful. Okay, and then our next questions are um, about Twitter and demographics. So first question is, do you only cover Twitter? And then someone asking whether demographics can only be tracked on Twitter. Right, so our demographics are fueled by our Twitter data, and that's available through users' Twitter bio. So what they're providing is then categorized into different areas. So top professions or top interests are fueled by Twitter. And our demographics right now are only available for Twitter. But uh, the whole app is obviously far, far beyond Twitter. It's, it's 70 million different sources, so blogs, forums, news sites, that kind of thing. It's just that demographics is easiest to fuel by Twitter because people talk about themselves so much. So it was our first, our first stage in developing <laughs> demographics was through Twitter. Okay, and then shifting back to sentiment, again, everyone's favorite topic. <laughs> um, isn't there a process to set keywords to segregate negative mentions from positive? Right. So um, just like we saw in creating a rule for specific keywords, you can also create that rule with keywords, but then instead of applying it to a category, you'd want to change the sentiment. So if you're seeing that, um, for instance, there's, whether it's your brand and you use um, a specific brand voice and Brainwatch is tagging it as negative, but really your brand voice is more sarcastic tone, you can tell Brandwatch that whatever mentions are coming in with specific keywords that to automatically change those mentions from negative to positive. Yeah, so like the word sick could be, if you're a video games company, or it could be really positive. If you're a, a pharmaceutical company, it's probably quite negative. So <laughs> we're trying to give you the control to be able to change that kind of thing. Another question, is it normal to see such a high percentage of neutral sentiment? It is normal, actually. Um, and if you think about, if you were to go to a bar or a, a store somewhere and listen to what people are talking about, most of it is benign. <laughs> it's, fairly, <laughs> it's fairly normal, it's fairly neutral. Emotionally charged language doesn't come out very often. Um, so most of the queries and brands we look at, the vast majority of the conversation is neutral. However, when you take away lots of that neutral language, you do start to see this sort of sharper con contrast between the positive and negative. Our next question, is it possible to screen conversations in a particular region or country? So that would be Kelly. Right, yes, you are. And you can either do that in two ways. One, when you're setting up your query, if you're only looking for mentions of a specific country, state, um, you can do that within our location code. So you type in exactly the location that you're looking for your mentions to be generated from, and then you would put that into your query. Or you can have a more broad query and then create within um, your filters the area of location that you're more interested. So either option, lots of ways to do things in Brightwatch. Uh, Chris has asked us, do you classify a retweet of a negative tweet as negative or neutral as it's not original content? I'll send that one to Joel. That is quite an interesting question, Chris. Um, and the way Brainwatch works is that it would, if one tweet counts as negative, then any other text matching that will also be negative. However, um, as Kelly described earlier, if you don't want that to be the case, you can actually modify it so that um, you can change it so that only the original one would count as negative. Mark always asks, is it possible to manually edit sentiment associated with a single post? Yes, very much so. Um, so if I was to go into my data set here, I could look at an individual component, or sorry, an individual mention, and within that, I have the ability to change it to either positive, neutral, or negative. So you can do it on an individual mention. Our next question is about uh, purchase intent. So how do you how do you convert purchase intent to reality? However you want to act on it might be different depending upon which brand you are. So um, if we return to Fiat example, um, if someone said, I really want to test drive that Fiat, or can't wait to get my hands on the wheel, you could directly go in uh, to those conversations and say, look, here's your local dealership, here's a voucher to test drive it for free, something like that, and actually act upon those conversations. But what it's really useful for is trying to um, understand what kind of impact your campaign has had upon people's willingness to go out there and buy things. 
So our next question is just following up on that, Joel, for you. Um, so is there a percent of intent to purchase mentions that we should try to achieve? And um, should this be compared to competitors for context? So basically benchmarking. If you are benchmarking, then that's really progressive and good, and I applaud you. Um, there's no fixed benchmark because it varies so much from different brands. So when people see um, you know, like a credit card advert or some medicine, they're less likely to say, oh my god, I can't wait to go and go and buy that. But if you're talking about things like clothes or um, normally food, the purchase intent is much higher. Like, oh god, I'm, I'm so thirsty now. I've seen that Coke advert, for example. With this specific campaign, it was, I think, 1% um, for David Beckham was people talking about actually going out and buying H&M things, and 2% for Beyonce. So that might um, lead you down the right kind of path, but I encourage you to do your own research and work out what your own benchmarks are. I think we've just about reached the end of our time. Uh, thank you all for attending. If you had any questions that weren't answered, we will follow up with you. We'll also be doing a blog post uh, that you should see next week. Yes. And as I mentioned <laughs> at the start of the session, we will be following up with the recording of this session as well as the slides for you to download uh, within a few days. So thanks very much, everybody, and have a great day.